vote as a trigger or any number of other uh, ways that you can affect the budget. Uh, uh, that's just up to it's up to the group that's, uh, I guess, in the minority. Liz Raines with KTG Liz. again. Uh, what would it take for the minority to change its vote um, during reconsideration on Monday when it comes to the CBR <laughs> sweep or the effective date? Yeah, and, and, and Liz, I don't know if there's anything that will change the minority's mind between now and Monday to uh, to uh, uh, accept uh, uh, the vote. Uh, I think that as we go through the process and we see what negotiations the majority has with the Senate and also with the minority, then I think you'll start seeing some movement on those items. Becky Bohr at the Associated Press. Uh, for Representative Chenault, you mentioned that, um, you know, if the bill go moves to the other side, there are ways to address that on the effective date. Can you speak to that specifically? And why sort of pick this fight now when um, I think Representative Prude had referred to it in the setting a few weeks ago, um, the minority sort of seeing the Senate as having its back and pushing for a lot deeper cuts than what the House majority has? And Becky, I don't, I don't see it as a, you know, what I look at is, is a lot of it has to do probably with process and some of the frustration that the minority has felt as far as having uh, deadlines put on amendments uh, on the House floor, uh, something that is, in, in my tenure here, I've never seen. I've never seen debate limited uh, in committees or on the floor. Uh, we've always, when I, when we were in the majority, we always listened to uh, everything that the minority had to say. May not have supported it, but at least they were given the opportunity to talk as long as they uh, felt that they needed to try to get their points across. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we've seen our debate limited uh, in the committees, in the subcommittee, and in the finance committee. We also seen it limited on the floor through a motion. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of amendments, but I think we spent about 31 hours of time, a little over 31 hours of time on the floor uh, debating the most important bill that's here that we have to deal with. And, uh, but we've done that over like 18 days. And, uh, you know, I have, I have sat on that floor until 5 o'clock in the morning or later uh, listening to the minority's amendments and listening to the debate on, on those amendments. And so there's, there's a little frustration there, and, and that probably is one reason why uh, the effective date clause failed. Uh, as I said, there's many opportunities between now and uh, the end of the session where uh, a, an effective date will be put back into the bill, whether it becomes over on the Senate version, and uh, you know then we'll have that opportunity to vote there again. I don't think it's, like I said, though, I don't think it's the intention of the minority to shut down government on July 1st. And, and maybe I could add to this as a newbie and why I voted the way I did on both of those. Um, <clears throat> as I say, I, I came down here because I saw the opportunity to have some robust discussions on how we can do things differently. And, and while I'm new and a, a large part of the House is new, we also seem to have new members in House Finance. And new approaches are fantastic and great. But I was, I felt that, as Representative Chanel said, I felt that, that there wasn't the usual um, discussion and even the act of some compromise coming through this process. I mean, I, I've spent many more hours on my nine years at assembly discussing budgets that were 430 million versus for over four billion. Many, many more hours. So, so the amount of hours of debate on the floor was really short to me. On top, you add all the stu uh, all the at eases. Excuse me, I didn't mean to editorialize, but. <laughs> <laughs> there doesn't seem to be, you know, there wasn't the robust discussion, but there also wasn't the reaching out. I, I, you, you folks heard me discuss early childhood 
development and you know the amount of money that's in Hess and the amount of money that's in Department of Education and everybody's doing their own thing and nobody's coordinating and after I gave that little I brought up that discussion on the floor it was interesting I got some very nice notes from the majority saying oh excellent point excellent point and we will be working with you on this maybe over the summer or over the next couple years that doesn't do it for me I mean you don't make change by talking it to death you you have to make it's a two process thing you do it within the budget and and you do it in your language in the budget and and the change happens but you don't sort of say well someday we'll do this so to me it really was a a, a vote of discontent and it was a protest vote i i'm seasoned enough to know about the effective date and i'm seasoned enough to know that it really has not a, a it, it's it's not a stumbling block and it doesn't mean that we're preventing the budget from coming to fruition maybe in 90 days who knows and i'm seasoned enough to know about the cbr but i had to put something on record that this was not the process that i thought i would be coming down to and so that's why i will not be changing my vote I, I would I would add uh, you know there's a certain amount of uh, bait and switch in this whole uh, uh, budget process. In other words, we went through standing committees and uh, uh, just almost to a, it, was, it varied by committee, but we're largely told that you know bring your amendments and changes forward. If you if if they're not dealt with uh, on the on the finance committee, that we can deal with them effectively in the house floor. So we basically taking that at face value, we brought amendments forward on the house floor that added up to tens of millions if not hundreds of millions of dollars worth of uh, projected savings uh, which those those budget reductions need to happen ahead of uh, asking our, our good constituents to uh, dig into their pockets but I mean there were very very reasonable reductions for instance there are 76 positions funded uh, for village public safety officers there's only 52 of them filled 24 vacant positions year over year over year millions of dollars worth of, of funds that could reasonably be reallocated or repurposed uh, in, in one manner or another. We could not get any traction on number of, on several of those amendments to try to repurpose those dollars to uh, uh, to their intended use. Uh, so I mean that's just one example, but there's 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 literally over a hundred examples of, of where those amendments were brought forward. And I you know I, again I think and if you look through they, they consistently failed 2218 22 I mean they they were uh, uh, and I think that that is a, a certain element of of, uh, of resolve I, I think on the part of the majority to not have any uh, changes happen to the budget but I think we really have a duty and responsibility to the public to fairly look at structural changes to the budget and uh, uh, as we go through this process uh, uh, to the to the end game with the with the Senate and seeing how that comes across I I look forward to having that opportunity to fairly represent our constituents thank you James Brooks from the Juno Empire again uh, Representative Birch, you had mentioned the Uber bill that's in Labor and Commerce. Can you give us a sense on where that bill is at? You had a meeting yesterday. Is that likely to move? I, I hope it moves. It's 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 great for Alaska. It's it's certainly great for my constituents in in, in Anchorage. Uh, we had two amendments that were brought forward yesterday. One of them, uh, one of the changes would permit uh, local taxing authorities. If you had a, a, a sales tax, uh, we don't have a sales tax in Anchorage, but a number of other communities do. That the uh, the application that you would have on your your phone. Uh, I've got Uber on my uh, cell phone, and I don't know if any any of you do, but that application would incorporate uh, were that amendment to. I mean, the amendment's been adopted, but if that <coughs> happens all the way through. Then that sales tax would be would be captured. So uh, I think there's uh, you know those kind of tweaks are are in process. Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic given the broad base of support that we've seen for uh, for uh, the uh, the TNCs or the, the Ubers and the Lyfts that uh, that that'll happen. Uh, and certainly it makes sense from the standpoint of we start looking at at uh, constituencies in the you know Matsu and the Chugach Eagle River area and places where they don't have uh, cab service. Is it really uh, it really really broadens the scope there and will uh, improve the service level for the public. And just wanted to follow up real quick. Uh, speaking, the obviously, chairman of that committee is from Juneau. You think uh, concerns here in Juneau have been met? Uh, 
I think so. The, 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 the testimony that we had was very supportive of the fact that it actually grows the pie. I mean, people are always, always figure like they're, they're trying to, to fight over a certain limited audience, but what the, uh, what the Uber and the Lyft uh, has shown us is that it actually enlarges the pool. There's more people that are willing to use the service if there's more service available. I mean, it, it came out during testimony there's more cabs available in Fairbanks than there are in, in, in Anchorage. Uh, you know, and, and when you start looking at the difference in the size of the community, so so the the idea that it's it's a limited audience I think is is uh, is is not exactly correct. I think the the fact is if you have a, a higher quality of service at a reasonable price, that it'll actually open up a market. It'll it'll attract people. We had a gentleman testified who was legally blind, and he was uh, very uh, adamantly in support of uh, this type of uh, ride sharing, where you would have an opportunity to call up and schedule a ride. Uh, in his his case, he can't drive. So. Uh, uh, I, th I think there's a, a broad range, a broad range of potential there, and, and promise for that. And I think, uh, again, I think some of the concerns are, are are overstated in that I think it will actually grow the market and grow the opportunity uh, statewide. Can I can I add to that? This is going to happen no matter what. Fifty <coughs> state, and you got a it's a, a younger population that's really driving ride, ride sharing. If this if this doesn't happen this year. This thing is going to happen. So you might as well be a part of, of, of shaping the, the future. Be a part of history. And, and instead of blocking it, and I know there's a few people out there that won't, don't want to see it go forward, just be a part of making sure we're addressing these concerns. But, you know, there's only, you know, past the budget and the revenue discussion this year, man, we got to pass, pass ride sharing this year. This is the future of Alaska. And, and this is the innovation that we've talked about. And as kind of the young guy here that wants to be able to use the app that's on my phone, I'm ready. I'm ready to get that thing out of here. Austin? Austin Baird from KTUU again. Representative Pruitt, on the fiscal plan, I, I guess I wonder why not release that, uh, say, 18 days ago or two months ago earlier in the conversation so that you could draw a contrast before the budget passed. You know, I appreciate that. Uh, one, of th one of the things that um, I wasn't going to get into this discussion. I was going to let the other conversations uh, just just happen organically. But what what we noticed is that as we kind of progressed through the process, that I felt that there was there were voices that weren't being heard, and they weren't necessarily even my concerns. And so I as as we kind of worked through it, and it took some time because we were going through the budget process, and I couldn't couldn't do it necessarily as fast as I wanted to. But uh, it wasn't, I didn't know two months ago that we would have the, the, uh, such a, a large group of people that felt that they weren't being heard. And so as I recognized that there was, there was a need for some bringing people together, that's when I started working with, uh, actually Representative Millette was, was a part of this. We started working together and we said, we need to be able to offer something that says this is closer uh, to the, an alignment with our uh, with our minority. I, again, to say, not every one of our minority is 100% on it, but this is closer aligned to where we think that we can offer this up and provide that contrast. So. Liz, Liz Rains with KTVA. I had a question along those lines. Um, the minority appears divided on the issue of the fiscal plan, and I'm wondering, uh, moving forward, with the caucus divided that way, how can you effectively get majority, convince majority members to go for one of these plans? Um, so that's, uh, I think that this is, uh, the, the minority, I wouldn't actually call it a, a division. Because there's really not, it's not like we're fighting over this thing. There's just different perspectives on, on how to go forward. And I, I think this is really important for them. It's important for the majority to also recognize, I think, the same thing that we've recognized in our cons in, in, from where we're coming from. Let's, let's take, for instance, someone asked earlier about Senator Welikowski. He's really concerned about that. He's got a, his, his, his uh, district is just north and to the west of where I am. Um, there's people in his community that are feeling disenfranchised in this. It's not just the members of the minority. It's not just Republicans. This is from all aspects of the spectrum. People have different thoughts on this. And my concern was is that we're, we're trying, it's either take 
the whole permanent fund, or, or, or you keep the whole permanent fund, or cut it to a thousand dollars. And so this was really that attempt to try to bring something in the middle. So I hope the majority really allows for a conversation. Um, it's it's on them to decide whether they want to have it. But I think it would be in their best interest to allow this conversation to take to take place. Because again, I'm going to go back to the concern is that we're going to divide Alaska even more. <laughs> If we do just try to push something through, that Alaskans turn around and tell us in two years, they turn around and say, yeah, we disagree with that. And then how do we start over? Where are you going to go from there? If they turn around and tell you that you, you, don't, that you went too far, I, I think, it's, a, I think it's, it's, a, it's prudent for them to, to ask these qu the same questions that we were asking, which got us to this point where we decided maybe we should put something out there. I would say there's absolutely unanimity of opinion uh, in the House Republican Caucus uh, that uh, income taxes uh, kick Alaskans uh, who may already be down. I think it's, uh, uh, it's a real concern that we have. Uh, and uh, the proposal that the House uh, Democratic majority is bringing forward to advance an income tax is unwarranted, unnecessary, and is going to uh, uh, level a huge uh, adverse impact on working Alaskans. And that's a unanimous opinion, in my view. Becky has. Becky, last one. Uh, Becky Borah, the Associated Press. There have been concerns raised on the other side uh, um, during the Attorney General's confirmations um, about a proposed uh, or about settlement talks between the state um, and Atna. And I, I might get this the pronunciation wrong, um, but the Clutina uh, Lake Road near Copper Center. And the governor's office took the steps this week of releasing a statement to try to clear up what it said was misinformation, saying it would push for an opportunity for public comment. Um, I, I'm wondering if you all have seen that statement and if what the state's position is um, calms any fears, I guess. Chris? Yeah, I'd be happy to uh, uh, address that. I, I, I spent uh, a good part of my life working on RS-2477s. And for those of you that uh, in the room that don't know what that is, it's, it's basically preserves public access uh, to, uh, to lands that uh, are otherwise inaccessible. And uh, uh, I think the Senate has raised some very legitimate concerns. Uh, I think the, the issue of public access to lands has to be preserved and maintained. Uh, and and I, I personally share some of the concerns that have been voiced in the in the Senate and we'll be looking very closely at that as we go through a confirmation process in the various uh, committees at the at the house with that folks thanks for coming and uh, we'll see you next week we're adjourned <laughs>